His name is Matt Dusk. He's uh, Canadian born and very highly rated in the crooner field after, but you started at seven and you decided to actually change from opera and classical after hearing certain musical artists in jazz. Yes. Um, from my understanding, you also have, have umpteenth nine albums. Ah, yes. it, that sounds about right. Uh, I'm with, old. You, well, no, you're actually <laughs> four years younger than I am. I'm sorry. I mean, I, um, uh, I look old. You are not old. How about that? Let's go with that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Matt, uh, my understanding is that right now you're touring uh, uh, with Sinatra and Pocket. Uh, you did two albums with it. Uh, 2020 and 21 were the years they were released with Volume 1 Sinatra and Volume 2 uh, Frank Sinatra as well. Um, prior to that, you had produced just the two of us, a duet album, and you had three different duet artists that were actually being used depending on the country that you were going to uh japan poland and canada canada Um, yeah uh now (laughs) i I am hoping that you have another album coming out because you did something superb with the last album that you produced um this is just phenomenal that you're coming to Moncton. You went to Halifax, you went to Charlottetown. Now we have you here in Moncton. This is the only three locations that you actually decided to attend um, for, um, for now, for now. Anyways, <laughs> uh, prior, prior to this, you were in Quebec and after Moncton is done, your touring is going to bring you completely to the East uh, outside of Canada, across the pond, uh, with uh, Poland being one of the major focal locations during that the, the touring dates, pretty much the whole of December from the look of it. Uh, so you're going to be here in Moncton on the 4th at the casino. Uh, I've seen that most of your previous recordings were done um, with some form of conjunction with Las Vegas, uh, any particular interest that brought you to those locations, or was it just because you were doing uh, this as a full-time uh, music singer slash composer? Uh, yeah, music? I mean, let's let's talk about the the history of the music I sing. The, the I guess the crooner um, genre, shall we call it? And we have to think about people at the prime when they were in their artistic prime or also their, I guess, fame as well would have been the crooners could have been everyone from Frank Sinatra to um, Dean Martin to Sammy Davis Jr. And Las Vegas was a big part of their career because they had residences there. Um as a young kid growing up, I got my hands on some of these, you know, kind of bootleg recordings of them doing their show in Las Vegas. And when I was 24, just by chance, um, I was invited to perform down in Las Vegas because there was a Fox TV reality show called The Casino. Mm-hmm. And it basically started my career in Vegas back in, I think it was 2003. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I lived there for four years. So uh, Las Vegas has obviously changed in 20 years. I mean, even if we look at 2004, we look back to, to 1984, it also had changed quite a bit. However, though, you know, if you land in McCarran Airport, uh, which is the Las Vegas airport, they're always playing Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis. I mean, that that music is still part and, part and parcel of the heritage of, of that place. They've got you know, Frank Sinatra Drive and um, another one named after Dean Martin, et cetera. So Las Vegas has always been attached to this kind of swing or croon, so to say. Mm-hmm. Um, now, crooner-wise, uh, I understand that your 
musical path eventually brought you into uh, Oscar Peterson under his wing, under a master class he was teaching, and you won uh, the Oscar Peterson um, <laughs> scholarship. scholarship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, how was that experience for you, uh, meeting one of the pia uh, piano jazz greats? You know, I th I think when you look back, I think anything in life, we 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 don't really understand what we're going through when it's actually happening, and we need time to kind of digest what happens. So it could be, you know, people getting married and having a wedding. You know, it's not till years later they look back and they look through back to the phones like, oh my gosh, what a great night, but you know, everything is so. Um, sudden and everything happened so i believe i had six to eight various master classes with oscar and you know there was only maybe 15 to 20 of us in 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 a room no bigger than maybe 400 square feet like it was quite quite an amazing thing and you know when you're going through these master classes with him what I remember the most was not necessarily, um, you know, the harmony and the mechanics of jazz music. It was, he would sit there and he would tell us his life story and he would tell us the importance of music and the importance of why it's, why you have to keep at it. The importance of understanding that financially it can always, there can be ups and downs. Um, mm -hmm. there might be times when you're going to quit. Like, if, for example, when you look at the the pandemic, many musicians, obviously because they, they were told they couldn't work, ha had to divert to a different career path. And the, what he gave myself and the other students, if you listen between the lines, and this is what I'm saying going back years later, mm -hmm. is music is a gift. It's always there for you. It doesn't really owe you anything, and, but it's your choice to take from it what you want. If you're in it for the money and if you want to become a millionaire, uh, that music is probably not <laughs> the, the most ideal path because there is faster ways to, to making money. Um, having someone like an elder statesman, a person who has, you know, not only success, but decorum and accolades, and then could just tell you something on a very, very basic level about mm -hmm. life. Those things, you 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 start to understand 20 years into your career. You're like, okay, I know what he was talking about. And those lessons echo back because he did make it. He did have a tough time. He had his ups and downs, yet he continued into music till the day he died. And and if you view it from that point, the stuff we learned from him um, was and is a path that hopefully all of us musicians can eventually say was ours as well. Hmm. That's true. Uh, speaking of pandemic, how did you cope with uh the sudden stoppage of uh, gigs and locations yeah. that you could actually perform. Well, again, now that we have some time to look back, mm -hmm. um, when you're going through it, it's all kind of a mumble. You know, it's a jump, mumble, jumble. It's like you don't really know what's happening. Um, it was the first time in my life. Uh, I mean, let's let's just talk professional career like I started basically getting paid full time in 1998 so it was almost what 22 years without a break mm -hmm. really like as a musician you have to understand is that we're all you know much like you uh if you have a passion and you do it you're always looking for the next gig right so when this gig is over like what's next what's next what's next um mm -hmm. and in this case it was like, holy crap, there is no next. It's just like, we're we're suspended. And having to see my friends and colleagues go through this, I we all handled it differently in our own way. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, I was like, I'm actually forgot what it is to actually slow down. <laughs> so, so it, 
it, it gave me an opportunity to, to 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 analyze how how different life is when you're outside of of the race, right? So mm-hmm. you're just like all the plans that you make, they're now gone. All the things you said where you would be have changed and you you know speaking about now um i can understand why some people haven't really fully recovered from you know the the mental impacts of the pandemic it was a big change yeah most of the musicians singers uh instrumentalists that i've interviewed so far uh pretty much all decided to either just focus locally um it for their own production the they were doing an album they were doing it between colleagues with file sharing uh, yep. some actually decided to actually do uh twitch <laughs> i know charlie acourt in nova scotia uh he's a bluesman and uh, he used twitch to keep the creative juices going and uh, connecting with his audience that way um, other uh, musicians across Canada did the same thing. It really depended on what, if you wanted to go that way, and it was either live streams through various methods or uh, nothing. And then you just yeah. focus on your art uh, solely in your own time, if you will. Well, I mean, one thing you, you'll notice is the amount of people who are done with live streams. I mean, it was like, everyone's like, oh, this is a new future. You don't have to travel anywhere. You can like talk to your whole audience in in one spot. And I was like, this is, you know, my my language, but it's total bullshit. Like like part of (laughs) part of what we do as musicians is like, yes, of course we love music. Of course we love playing with each other. That's part of it. But the audience is such a huge part of it. They, they, They underestimate the importance that they bring to a show. So, you know, looking and singing at a black lens like this just dark cavernous pit of I don't know. <laughs> it's not what music is meant to be. Music no. is meant to be shared. So that's why, you know, even now, the the level of live streams is definitely, definitely reduced. And I'm going to even say yeah. 99%. Like I'm going to go, I, I'm, not, I'm not being hyperbolic. I think it's like 99%, period. Mostly like yourself, uh, touring is heavy. Uh, you have to be focused. You have to make sure that everything is planned, coordinated, and follow the, the path that beckons you to bring you to the next door and to actually uh, present yourself and share your emotions and share your physical being with the people Everyone. that are actually in yeah. the room. <laughs> that's that's the gig, man. I mean, uh, you, you can't change thousands of years of history. I mean, no. <laughs> it's just like, oh, here's new technology. It's like, great. Convenience, because we can't. But Mm -hmm. man, as soon as that door opened, um, it was also very interesting to see, you know, the the, the slow return to music, the audiences as well. In the beginning, it was like, holy crap, now everyone's touring at once. Now, you know, every small town in the world and big Mm -hmm. city, you've got triple the amount of shows. So, you know, it was it's quite deflating also for many acts to go on the road and go, holy crap, it's more expensive and there's less people here. But. No. It was never about them. It was just the return to a different paradigm. Yeah, the venues were having issues right at the beginning of the opening of not embargo, but restrictions. And of course. a lot of the gigs had to cancel. You possibly went through that yourself? Like when you say that I go through it myself. So as a jazz musician, you know, we make this joke. It's like, we do the same show if we play for nine people or 12 people, <laughs> right? So um, I grew up in bars like that. That was my, you know, as soon as I was, as soon as I was 19, I was getting, you know, three, four hour sets at bars. And some nights there'd be like two people there and I, I wouldn't care. I'd be like, there's two people here. Let's put the show on. But unfortunately, there are some people who are, you know, affected by the by the amount of people in the audience or how many empty seats there are for me if there's one person smiling let, let's do the gig man let's have a good night <laughs> so basically you're unaffected by the lack of uh, 
energy from the room. You're you're more driven with your own passion and dedication to the music. I, I will say playing for a full house that's like going nuts is is a riot. It's like it, it's it's so much fun. But just as that is the anomaly, so is the two people there not paying attention. I mean, and there's everything in between. So mm -hmm. as a performing artist, you have to understand um, your job is to not judge the audience. Your job is to perform and interact with the audience as they interact with you. We have a we have an agreement together. We they buy a ticket. I show up. My band shows up and we have an agreement to engage in a couple hours of excitement the best way we can. I know that your major uh, talent is your vocals. Uh, smooth as silk or smooth as uh, fine whiskey. Oh, perfect. Uh, <laughs> uh, the only thing that boggles my mind is, have you learned a musical instrument to actually accompany yeah. you? Yeah, I've got a piano right over here. <laughs> no, I've been playing piano since I was uh, since I was a kid. I, I I usually don't play piano on a stage just because my piano player is much better than than me and I'm a better singer than him. You know, we we all find our trades. Um, I I prefer when performing to an audience to have an open physicality instead of being behind an instrument. Oh, nice. um, that's just my preference. I'm not, I'm not judging anyone who, who, who does one way or the other. Um, I would love to be able to play piano better, as I'm sure every musician would love to play a different instrument better, too. Or sing better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we have auto-tune for that now. Don't worry. Oh, Pro no. Tools can do everything. <laughs> um, the one thing that uh, with everything done right now you're touring you're presenting yourself you're making an opening and hopefully an album down the road but we'll we'll have it with sinatra with you uh, as a human being and as a musician you're you're alive you're well uh, do you have a, a hobby <laughs> Because not many people do. If they're instrumentalists, they tend to really just stick to their guns with guitars. They may read a book or something else. But what um, about you? That's that's a good question. Uh, you know, if we all ask ourselves, what do we enjoy doing in our time? Obviously, you know, music and performing is what musicians love to do. Um, mm -hmm. When you're an artist that is touring in multiple countries, unfortunately, you know, 95% of what we do is administration, right? It's planning, it's booking hotels, tickets. Uh, some people have people, I'm pretty hands-on. I basically run my own business top down and I've got a great team of people who, who help. Uh, when I do have some time <laughs> off, um, I grew up with my dad fixing old cars. Okay. Um, so before, um, before my daughter was born, I used to be, you know, a garage rat fixing stuff all the time. And uh, actually today I was actually working on, I have a 1962 Morgan oh. and uh, I was uh, working on it today and I'm glad I didn't cut my hands for the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the very least, I know that you're a car junkie, so that's actually a good thing. You're one of the rare ones. The other people, it's either cooking or uh, reading a book skating i get dirty biking. <laughs> you get dirty yeah um the the last question i have uh because you just listening to you is pretty much the whole kit and caboodle um uh, it's a weird question i have asked every single artist that i've done interviews with about this but it's simply what's your favorite dish as food oh uh pizza Hand down. There we go. So I, I, I'm I'm sorry. I sound I probably sound like a child, but um, <laughs> no, you don't. You, you know, you know what the problem is is that when you're on the road touring all the time, it's like, oh crap, we're late. We have to get this uh, load in, sound check. Ah, everything's bright. Ah, the shows. Just give me some pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, that's positive thinking from a man who's gone through. Uh, a lifetime of um, 
<laughs> education and wanting to uh, to run the family business the tools that you learned at those institutions actually served you quite well as we can see you're the prime minister of crooning oh well uh, thank you <laughs> No, you are because you do everything. I mean, the only thing I'm, I'm uh, that I was hoping to see is you goofing around on TikTok, but you're that's, pretty much. Don't worry, just right. don't worry, that's coming. Uh, unfortunately, I understand with the power of social media that it, that is that is coming. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 coming. Don't worry, I'll be a I'll be a dork. I'll be everyone's <laughs> dork. That's part of the fun, right? Yeah. Well, the, folks, this is the end of the interview between me and Mr. Dusk, a fabulous man, fabulous Canadian, and he's going to be in one of your towns. Check out his website, mattdusk.com. Um, there's a listing of his touring dates and also merchandise and a whole bunch of stuff that you can get from him. Support this artist, as always. Discs, do you do vinyl? We do. Um, for those that are going back into vinyl, he's got vinyl. So, Matt, thank you so oh, much. Oh, I thought you meant vinyl pants. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Oh, some actual records. Yes, those two. <laughs> vinyl pants? Oh, yeah, no. man. Halloween. It's Halloween time, right? we got to dress up as Catwoman, whatever. <laughs> oh, okay. 